Ralph Spech, welcome to Partnering Leadership. I am thrilled to have you in this conversation with me. Thank you. Mahan, it's my pleasure to be with you today. Ralph, uh, your book, Building Corporate Soul, talks about organizations actually having a soul, which I really appreciated, both the thinking behind it and the frameworks you have in the book. But before we get to it, would love to know first whereabouts you grew up and how your upbringing impacted the kind of person you've become. Yeah, so my upbringing is quite quite some time ago, isn't it? I mean, um, I'm in the, I'm in the you aren't 50s. that old, Ralph. Come on, <laughs> well, it's the late fifties. I mean, you know what? I was just thinking about it, and actually, um, so I grew up in a in a small town in in, in the northern part of Germany near a place called Gütersloh. And in these days, as we record this at the, the beginning of March, and in Europe, there's a there's an interesting sentiment um, that we didn't have for decades um, because there's a war uh, pretty close to us. And I grew up in a place near near, near that town of Gütersloh where there was a Royal Air Force base because at that time, Germany was still um, with the Americans and the French and the uh, um, and the British, Brit uh, British and uh, and obviously in Eastern Germany with the uh, Soviet Union and uh, and that's now more than thirty years ago uh, since since unification. But when I was a kid, <clears throat> those uh, jet fighters from 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 the UK were uh, were always there because the base was just just a few miles uh, away. And um, in my upbringing. Um, because I, I didn't have that much to do with the army in my life, but um, my father was actually um, uh, a civil engineer in, um, in, 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 in the town hall of, um, of a small city we were, we were living, and uh, he actually took care um, as his second job um, on a city partnership between the city that I was living in and a French city. And so I spent a lot of time in my youth, probably six, eight weeks every year um, in France, in that uh, little uh, city where uh, we had partners with and uh, spent time with, with, with French families. And I think um, that time uh, actually um, made me um, a person that looked uh, very easily and, and, and with lots of interest into other cultures and other countries. And um, actually my French at that time was much better than my English, which uh, right now it takes a week when I get into France to get into the rhythm. But um, actually my business life, uh, I spent a lot of time in, in countries around the world globally. And uh, I guess it's, it's because of that time in France where um, I had a lot of inter interaction with a so different culture, uh, which I appreciated a lot. Uh, quite a lot, and uh, I think it, it, it was something that uh, that stuck with me since then. That ability, Ralph, to connect with other cultures is really important, not just on a global scale, but also on a human scale, which is important for leaders as they are leading their organization and the many cultures within their organization. But uh, you also spent a a significant portion of your career, Ralph, in marketing and advertising. How did you get involved in that field? It's an interesting story because my initial plan was a different one. Um, I actually wanted to become a journalist um, and did freelance journalism and uh, actually had uh, the opportunity to spend some time with uh, one of the leading magazines here in Germany. And while it was fascinating in week one, I was a bit unsure in week two and I was clear in week three, <laughs> this wasn't gonna be my thing. And uh, I, I landed in advertising and uh, I mean, there's no pun intended, but the um, I spent 22 years with McCann Erickson and uh, obviously their mantra has always been for the last whatever hundred years, truth well told. And when you connect that with advertising, and I tell you that I wasn't so impressed with the journalism bit, I mean, it's a special story. But um, so I, I spent 22 years with, with McCann uh, uh, Erickson and, and uh, 
what a great time we had and um, worked with lots of global accounts, built global brands. Um, I mean, it, it's been it's been a fascinating time and, and uh, lots of friendships with colleagues from around the world have uh, have have stayed. And um, yeah, and, and after McCann Erickson, um, actually a big adventure started because uh, one of my former colleagues, um, Steve Wolford, who um, had the opportunity to create a, an advertising agency from scratch with a joint venture with Jaguar and Land Rover back in 2011, he called me one night and said, Ralph, you know, I, um, I, need actually, I actually need someone who can help me build the global network and especially the European side of things. Uh, are you interested? And he told me about it and I said to him, I mean, are you joking, man? I mean, uh, this sound, sounded too good to be true. And um, he said, no, 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 it's no joke. It's, it's serious. I said, send me a business plan. And he did. And the next evening I called him and said, okay, the business plan is pretty much on the money. So um, let's do this. And the rest is history. So you had a lot of success in that. And uh, eventually you transitioned out of uh, advertising and you ended up writing this book, Building Corporate Soul. What got you to thinking that corporations and organizations would and should have a soul, Ralph? I think there's two or three answers to that question. Number one is when I stepped down as CEO of Spark 44, I received, as you would expect, lots of messages and WhatsApps and, and text messages and emails from people in, uh, inside the organization. And um, so did I. But um, the messages were different than I was thinking or was I was expecting what would come. Because what you would expect is the is a message like we had a great time and, and, and remember what we did here and, and, and all of these things and, and hope to meet you see you soon and all, all these things but the messages I received were at a much deeper level I would say because people reflected on their time inside Spark 44 um, and occasions where they had inter interactions with me that they still re uh, remembered um, even six, seven, eight years later, because for them they were um, pivotal in, in, in their career. And uh, I mean, one sentiment that came through a lot of messages was I have accomplished things that I never thought I was capable of. And the these messages, when I was contemplating about them uh, over Christmas uh, that, that year, I was like, they are just too important to just stay on my iPhone. And I thought there's a, there's a bigger message here. And um, outsiders, when they looked at Spark 44, they said, well, I mean, successful agency, they grew from zero to 1200 people in just a few years and 18 countries and global and, 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 and won an Effie award for this and that and the other. And, um, all of these things, and, and they're all true, there's nothing wrong, but actually the legacy isn't that. I think the legacy is that the, the Spark 44 was a company with, with a soul and uh, a very unique culture. Um, and and it's, it's my co-founders and myself who helped to create an environment where that could flourish. And we hired a lot of right people to help build it and, and, and grow it and scale it. and. Uh, so I think every company has a culture. You can't have a company without a culture, but only few got so. So Ralph, I wonder, were you intentional in creating that soul that resulted in what the employees that messaged you had noticed and how it had impacted them? Or was it that the way you led ended up in the organization having a soul? I think it's the former. I think when we started back in 2011, sometime in February, we got the green light. Um, and uh, the green light actually meant that the five of us had to set up a global agency in, in LA, Frankfurt, London, and Shanghai until the 1st of June, right? So not, not a lot of money, uh, not a lot of, sorry, 
let's do that again. So we had to, <clears throat> so that the five of us had to uh, set up an agency, a global agency in Los Angeles, in Shanghai, in Frankfurt, and in London until the 1st of June. So not a lot of time. And um, still remember that day because when we got the green light, this is now, we're doing this. We went to, in London, we, we saw, uh, <clears throat> do that again. I still remember that day because when we received the green light, we went to London, the five of us, and uh, spent the day in a conference room in a befriended agency with lots of flip charts. And we were trying to figure out how do we know really do it? And uh, we talked about culture and then we started, well, okay, what kind of culture do we want to have in this place? And uh, it was a bit difficult to, to put that into words. And then we flipped the question and asked ourselves, what culture do we not want to have in this place? And that actually uh, kicked it off big time. And so within, I think, 15 minutes, the flip charts were full. Um, and when we uh, grouped the points on, the, on those flip charts, it became very clear what we had to do in terms of organizational design to allow that culture to happen. A single PL was a big reason. Um, and actually, we had a big constraint, obviously. I mean, normally a startup doesn't start with 80 people. We started with 80 people, it's a lot. But uh, those 80 people were actually four times 20 people because they were in LA, Frankfurt, London, and Shanghai. So resource was always a challenge. And um, so we said, well, let's then hire complementary skills in the four locations so that we got all the skills we need, but we don't have every skill everywhere, which actually created a sense of collaboration between the four offices that was actually second to none. And, and remember, this was 2011, and there was no Zoom those days. We used GoToMeeting that already existed. But it felt to many people that were joining, it felt like uh, they entered an agency on Mars because they <laughs> never, they had never been on a on a on a on a WebEx, go to meeting, Zoom, whatever you call it today, uh, and 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 even FaceTime was kind of ah yeah you can use that in business too okay, so um, all these things happened at the, at that time and I think that that was intentional in terms of of, of the culture. Um, and, and then I think we, we made a lot of good decisions in terms of hiring the right people. You always also make bad decisions in, in this area, but um, we had, I think, a great team and that team grew and grew and grew and grew and the culture was growing with it. And I think that was the, the biggest achievement. And one of the main points, Ralph, I consistently make is that Every organization, as you also alluded to, has a culture. The best have an intentional culture. So as you were putting together the plans for the organization, you decided how intentional uh, you wanted to be with respect to culture. And a great way of doing that is exactly how you did it. You looked at what you didn't want to be part of that culture, and that helped you uh, make this intentional culture for the organization. I wonder from your perspective, in what way would moving the culture of an existing entity be different from establishing the culture of a new entity as you were doing then? Well, as we grew, um, before I get to, to, the, to the real answer, as we grew, um, there were two phases, right? The first three years, we grew from 80 people to 270 people. Then we grew from 270 people to 650 people within three months, okay? Wow. You can imagine what happened, okay. And at that stage, there were lots of new offices and there were some of us that were just growing in size extremely. And as we were doing that, we were basically bringing in full, complete teams from other agencies that were embedded into our culture. And it was a huge challenge. And it didn't always work out. Worked out. I mean, there's only so much you can do. Um, I mean, leadership can create an environment where these things happen. Um, but if it's 
too many people in too short a time, it, it is a challenge. So coming back to your question, if you have an existing organization, um, it's a tough gig because what you need to achieve, and that's where the framework that, that's in the book, I think, comes in, you need to achieve a, a, a situation where everybody is clear about what the company really is about, um, where it wants to go, how it wants to get, uh, get there, and how that journey manifests itself in many uh, different things. So for instance, when we um, grew, one of the things that helped significantly um, were lots of events that took place that were kind of coded, right? We had lots of great people and uh, many of them actually took the initiative and, and, and management gave them the space to do it, to develop initiatives that uh, actually were critical to the culture as, as we were growing. So for instance, Mill and our uh, colleague in, in LA uh, created Sparker Palooza. So for e everyone in the US, the Palooza element is something that's easily to understand for everybody outside the US, like Palooza, what are you talking about? <laughs> And so Millen had this idea of a, a, a week of inspiration um, and, and outside speakers coming in and, 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 and pro bono projects and a bit of party, a bit of fun and all these things. It was great. And we all thought this is one is, is a real great initiative. So we said, well, Sparkapalooza can also happen in Tokyo and it can happen in Dubai. And we had the Mumbai office and the Dubai office come together, um, do that and happen in London and in, Fra in Frankfurt everywhere. And for instance, another uh, colleague, uh, two colleagues actually, Gonzalo from Madrid and uh, Leticia from Sao Paulo, because they were like Spanish and Portuguese countries and had a lot of things that they had to do together anyway. They came up with the idea, why don't we create something where a colleague from one office spends a month or two in the other office and, they, and two people just swap jobs. And um, they called this Spark b, &B right? <laughs> and uh, we had the first, the first two people who moved to Sao Paulo, Madrid, and Madrid, Sao Paulo. Um, we just uh, um, uh, merchandised that uh, like nothing else in, in, in internally. And guess what? People from offices connected with other offices because they wanted to work together or wanted to change jobs and swap jobs. And can I spend uh, a week in Sydney or a month in Sydney? Everybody wants to spend a month in Sydney. It's difficult to get anybody out of Sydney. But these kind of things, um, you've got two choices, right? When these happen, or three, two, three choices. Your first choice is, are you endorsing that as management? Do you think, is it, do you let that happen? Because very often people say, no, 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 we don't have budget for that. And actually budget was the least of the problem in, in, in this because it was like a $500 flight. I mean. That's yeah, kind of manageable. But the second uh, choice is, are you getting serious about it? And get, are you getting conscious uh, about it? Do you drive consciousness about the initiative? Is it just one person from that office and another person uh, just swap jobs and you don't tell anybody about it and it just happens? You can do that, but then it doesn't help, help the culture. It's a good initiative for these two, but that's it. You have to code it. Uh, code it. That's why we called it Spark B&B. We merchandise it internally, and um, it, it actually um, created a life on its own, which was critical to the culture, because one of the things that we were always about from the very first day in this flip chart uh, conference room in London 2011, it was about creating a global, uh, globally aligned team uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and an inspired community across the world. And uh, the point that you make, Ralph, in that uh, part of culture is establishing practices, but as important, if not a more important part of that culture, is the communication internally that comes afterwards, whether you are a marketing and advertising agency or even smaller organizations in any industry, retelling those stories so people understand what the organization values is as big a part of making sure that culture permeates the organization 
then it is just having the specific initiatives. Now, so you did all of that uh, running the organization. And afterwards, with all the comments that you got from the team members, you realized, I need to capture this thing into organizational soul. And you came out with the soul index. What is the soul index, Ralph, before then we break down the different parts of the soul system? Yeah, so when I wrote the book, you talk to a lot of people, you interview a lot of people, you research, and, and you are constantly looking for case studies that make sense in, the, in this context. And as I was doing that over six, seven months, I think I've got a huge pile of, 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 of surveys and rankings and all of these things. And as I was work, working through them, my way through them, um, the same names, same companies popped up again and again and again and again. And so as I finished writing the book, I was like, okay, now why don't I start playing with the numbers um, a little bit? Because the book makes the point that um, when you're evaluating corporate culture, the people you should never ask are the CEOs. The people you should ask are the people on the ground, right? I mean, I got a I got an email a few weeks back from, from, from a CEO who said, I, I like your idea of soul and that's great. And we also got a company with soul. And I, I, my response to him was, congratulations. I'm so happy for you. But I would actually <laughs> like to hear it from your people. Uh, and, and, uh, and then I'll re I'm, I'm going to hug you. But um, seriously, so <clears throat> what I basically did was... Um, I looked into various studies about employee satisfaction, employee engagement, and CEO approval, and gave them a significant weight uh, in, in this index over business success and brand success. And um, I was actually surprised. I, I mean, um, I thought that this would be good, but I didn't uh, believe until I saw it. Uh, how good it was because um, the top 20 companies, uh, the index is, is, is led by Adobe, uh, a head of Salesforce and Microsoft. So three tech companies, interestingly, um, but the mix is wide. So you've got companies that have uh, been around for more than a, than a century, like Deloitte um, Consultancy or American Express. And the youngest company in the, in the index is Workday, which is uh, 2005, if I'm not mistaken. So you get all sorts of companies. You get Hilton Hotels, um, you got LinkedIn um, in, in there. So all categories. And the, the, the weighting of employee satisfaction, engagement, CEO uh, approval is what drives success in that, in that ranking. And as the, as the ranking was complete, I asked uh, a befriended um, bank whether they could uh, run a portfolio check on this and, and look at how it did. And um, there were many tech companies in the, in the index, so it had to be good because obviously the last years were, were, were great for tech companies. Um, but it actually, on a five-year basis, uh, even hit the it hit NASDAQ by some about 20%. So, um, it's quite something. So the, the idea of looking and, and, and listening to employees, um, and obviously it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, these are the people that are closest to what is happening inside a company. Um, they know much earlier and much faster than any one of us what's happening somewhere. It's a relevant and important point, Ralph. You also mentioned even with the CEO that had followed up with you or emailed you about the fact that uh, uh, their organization has soul. One of the challenges I see in leadership is that in many instances, many leaders uh, uh, read books like yours, nod and say, yes, that's exactly right. And we've got it. So uh, your key point, first of all, is that it's not just up to the CEO or the head of the organization, no matter what size the organization, to determine if the organization has soul or not. 
it's primarily up to the people in the organization to be able to determine if the organization has soul. So what is this soul system? What is an organization that has soul and how does it differ from purpose? We hear a lot about the need for organizations to have purpose. What is soul and how does it differ from purpose? Yeah, purpose has been the buzzword for the last 10, 15 years, hasn't it, right? And um, I just came across a, a, a post on LinkedIn, which was about the purpose washing top 10. Right? <laughs> um, and I just, I couldn't resist. I had to print it out. And so purpose washing top 10, before I answer your question, is number one, your marketing department is running branding on purpose workshops to jazz up your purpose statements. <laughs> You force your top managers to participate in a two-day private purpose retreat to spell out their guts in public. Three, you just hired McKinsey to dust off your codes of conduct. Four, you employed a totally diverse Gen Z chief purpose officer who will fix the purpose issue. Five, you just added your like to the, the other 30,000 on one of Simon Sinek's LinkedIn posts suggesting that why is everything. <laughs> so I think five is enough, all right? So I think purpose is important, absolutely. But I think, and that's kind of where the purpose washing uh, comes in. Purpose is a means to an end, it's not the end. And very often you look at these purpose discussions and it feels like it's the end and it actually isn't. So um, the soul system is a framework for companies to organize themselves in a way to um, consciously look at their culture. And it starts with purpose, but the purpose that I'm talking about is what I call a shared purpose. Because you've, you've seen it a hundred times, right? You come into an office, great corporation, receptionists behind the wall, behind the receptionists on the wall, great letters, typography, fine art, wonderful words. Um, and then you walk from the reception to the conference room or where they have to go. And you, you kind of sense the uh, the feeling in, the, in that organization and it has nothing to do with what, what's been written on the wall. And you're in the conference room, you, you get into that meeting and that's also a different world. So shared purpose means shared on two levels. Sh level number one, shared by the executive team, by the leadership team, because you look at the EY uh, um, study, the business case for purpose, and uh, they basically say, they, are, they, are, they asked 5,000 leaders across the world and 50% of them say, well, our com company, uh, company strategy is not reflective of our purpose. Well, good night. I mean, why have one <laughs> in the first place, right? So uh, sh shared by the executive team is critical, but then even more critical is shared with all stakeholders, predominantly the employees. If they don't know what the purpose of the, co the company is, I mean, you can't blame them, right? And the same study says that the executives who said 50, of which 50% said our company the strategy is not effective of our purpose, they're saying only 38% of our employees understand our purpose. So basically more than 60% don't. So you gotta have that purpose clear. And the next level of the soul system is what I call the shared understanding. So you see there's a pattern, shared is the magic word here. And shared understanding looks at vision, mission, values, like the three um, things that every consultant needs to be clear about. But I've added a fourth one, which I call spirit. And to me, spirit is the intended culture of the company. It's like that moment with the flip charts where you think about what culture you want in your place. And some country, companies are great with their values and you don't need a spirit statement. <clears throat> LinkedIn is one of them. The seven LinkedIn values are amazing. I mean, they go member, members first, relationships matter, be open, be honest and constructive, demand excellence, take intelligent risks and act like an owner. So they, they have the full spectrum. There's the inward focus, the outward focus. And when you listen to these seven, you're clear about what LinkedIn <clears throat> is supposed to be. And, their vision of creating economic opportunity to every member of the global workforce and their mission uh, to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. You are in your head, when you listen to this, you're already clear about what that organization is. So the purpose is no surprise. 
The purpose of, of LinkedIn is to facil facilitate professional networking. So it all makes sense. It's, it's well-rounded, it's very clear. So we got the shared purpose, we got the shared understanding, and that's the theoretical part, right? And then it gets really practical. Gotta get your hands dirty and, and, and roll up your sleeves because we're talking about the shared behaviors. And this means all the elements inside an organization that affect how people um, perceive the culture of that place. Whether that this is about hiring, it's about promoting, it's about which companies to partner with, how to deal with customers, all these elements um, are, are critical. And companies that do that well, basically create an integrity between the strategy part, the purpose, shared purpose and the shared understanding and the behaviors. And as you rightly said, it's walking the talk. And if you do that, you're very close to uh, having a company with soul. Ralph, I find it's very hard to do that well, even in the smallest of organizations, making sure that the behaviors align with what you mentioned are that shared understanding and the shared purpose. What in your view are some of the best approaches in making sure that the behaviors are aligned, whether it's a team or an organization of a dozen people or an organization that is larger? I think you need to be really clear about how you incentivize people, which behaviors you reward and which, one you, which ones you don't. Um, so for instance, I mean, I don't know the LinkedIn uh, compensation uh, model in detail, but if you have a, uh, values scheme that says members first, relationships matter. Um, these are measurable things. So you can actually measure how um, people inside the organization, teams inside the organization are doing uh, on, on those values, how they deliver um, on, on them or the, the element of act like an owner. Um, so how much risk taking is there? How much initiative um, is there? I mean, for instance, Adobe, who uh, rank number one on the, on, on the Soul Index, have this wonderful um, little thing, the, the red cardboard box. Uh, as an employee, you can basically say, I, I'd like to have a, uh, the red cardboard box. And if you get one, it's got a lot of little nice things uh, in there. Uh, and one thing that is a bit of a surprise to everyone, because it's a uh, credit card with a thousand dollars on on it and uh, you can basically use that credit card to buy anything you need within a thousand dollars to make sure the innovation that is in, in your head can be uh, brought to life or can, can be presented in a way that management can decide whether that is an, an initiative that is actually worth really building um, on. So um, if you're a company that is high on innovation like Adobe uh, is and, and high on creativity like Adobe is, that's where you go. So it's everything. It's about looking at everything a company does and look back in the mirror. Does that match? And is, can I connect this back to the purpose, the vision, mission, and the values and the spirit? And if you do that, you're chances are not bad. But as you say, it's tough. And the larger the organization, the tougher, I would say. And nobody is perfect. I mean, I'm not a saint. I'm, I haven't done everything right. And I would say nobody does everything right. But that's not the point. If you understand where you want to go, then chances are that you hit that point. I mean, when, I, when, we, when we opened our first office, I had a uh, a proverb on the on the walls, which is a South African proverb, which is the, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And, and looking in, in, into or tapping into the resources of your coworkers and your teams is such a powerful thing, like Sparkapalooza or the Spark b, &B and then you code these things and, and, and they become memorable. And as you quite rightly said, 
like Aristotle already said, I mean, tell them once, tell them twice, tell them three times. And if you think they have understood it, start doing it again, and then it will probably resonate. So um, you, you got to do these things, but uh, I think you can only really do them and successfully do them if you're clear about the purpose and you're clear about the vision and the mission, because if you're not, it becomes somewhat erratic and random and uh, people will be lost. And that's uh, not helpful if you want to align um, people around the globe or even if it's in a, inside a small firm somewhere on the countryside. That clarity is really important and it's critical in order for people to be able to have shared behaviors. One other element that you also mentioned is a healthy level of paranoia, which I believe the best leaders and organizations have. It's a, call it a growth mindset. We are not there yet, or a certain level of paranoia with an understanding of the need to constantly improve. So as people hear this, to you mentioned that uh, I'm not a perfect ideal of this. None of us are. But what I find, Ralph, is that the leaders that do the best job in being able to show the behaviors through their example and encourage these shared behaviors, look at the systems in the organization, but there's a healthy level of paranoia. They don't ever look at it and say, got it, we've got it, we're good, we can move on now. <laughs> no, I mean, celebrate the moment. It's always good, seize the moment, but, but never forget that things can be very different tomorrow. And one thing, the only one thing that is for sure, they will be different, perhaps not tomorrow, but possibly the day after tomorrow. And you talked about the soul index and, and I gave you an idea about what, how it's comprised. But when I looked into it again, um, into these companies, one thing uh, came out and the numbers are a bit distorted uh, by Jeff Bezos, who um, um, moved away from his uh, CEO post because otherwise the numbers would have even been higher. So the average tenure of a CEO is like six and a half years or something like that. Um, with the uh, top 20 soul index companies, uh, it's close to 10 and it would probably be like 12, 12 and a half if Bezos wouldn't have sat down um, last year. And all of these companies in the last 20 years or the last 15 years haven't had more than two. So continuity is a great element. Um, and Satya Nadella on Microsoft is probably a great example of uh, somebody who obviously well understood that uh, culture was a big challenge for the company when he took over and look what he's done. And uh, we were gonna see what happens to Activision Blizzard in, in terms of uh, aligning cultures. That's gonna be a big one, um, but I mean, they will be aware of it. And so let's see what happens. But um, if you accept for a second that Culture is not a nice to have, but it's something that you actually can shape in a way that it helps driving success in a way that people are with you on that journey. Then I think you're halfway there because then it's about getting people on the bus and then make sure you get into first gear and get going. Ralph, at least the leaders I interact with agree that it is really important. So they have that recognition and understanding. There are different levels of thoughts with respect to whether they can significantly impact it or not. So it's not that it's not important. They, in some instances, they believe the organizational culture is where it needs to be. And my challenge is, that growth mindset and that healthy paranoia says you're never there yet. And in other instances, they wonder how they can impact it, which is part of why with your soul system and the frameworks, you talk about specific ways, including even the leadership principles that, that are used for leaders to be able to bring soul into their organizations 
with that shared purpose, with that shared understanding and shared behaviors in order to impact the culture too. Correct. I think the, the leadership uh, principles inside a company need to be clear to everyone. And when I started my professional life, which I started in a, in a large publishing group, which was Bertelsmann um, uh, Media House at the time, um, they had something which they called the, the constitution of the company. And I was like 22 or 23 or whatever. <clears throat> and I had no idea. And I was like, constitution and company, how does that go together? <laughs> and, um, so I was very skeptical when I first got hold of it. And, but as I spent time there and, and saw what leadership behaviors did exist, it, it started to make sense. And uh, I was actually talking to my father-in-law um, a few months back. And when he looked at the, he read the book and he said, well, and he'd been with IBM for decades. And uh, he came back and said, I, um, I found something that might be of interest to you. And he gave me a constitution of the leadership for the leadership of IBM from late seventies or early eighties. Wow. And uh, and you read this, and you think, okay, something must have happened on the way, right? Because you look at these constitutions, these 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 principles or organizational principles of of companies, and you are well. If everybody would have just done it in a similar fashion and stayed true to it. I would probably have never written the book because it wasn't so specific and so unusual that you talk about a company was sold because every company has it. But um, something has happened on the way. And, and, and I think this debate that has been around for the last year or last years about um, uh, shareholder capitalism versus stakeholder capitalism um, is, a, is, a, is a healthy debate. And uh, those people that look at stakeholder capitalism and say, well, okay, this is just everybody being nice to each other and all of that crap, they miss the point. It's, it's still about capitalism, right? It's still about making profits um, and all of these things, but um, making them in a different way and, and, and getting your priorities um, sorted. And I'm actually I'm very happy um, that uh, the SEC is taking action and, and the human capital disclosures are getting to a new level. And let's see what happens when they be, will be announced later this spring. But uh, I think the, the, the mere fact that it's on the agenda and um, that people in, in, in corporations need to look at this through, dif through a different lens, I think will do a lot of positivity um, to businesses in the US. And, and once it's happening there, it's happening globally. So I think um, it's, it's moving in the right direction. It is. And one of my own beliefs is, Ralph, for quite a while, access to capital was the issue. So in many instances, organizations of all sizes position themselves best for access to capital. Mm -hmm. Now the competitive advantage is access to talent. And I believe that will continue to be the case. Therefore, engaging more effectively with all stakeholders, including having a soul, impacts both the employees and that retention and the potential recruiting of the employees. So it becomes the sought after competitive advantage. Absolutely, because you look at what everybody calls the great resignation, which I think Madela and Roslansky call with exactly. Um, the right brains involved, the great reset um, or reshuffle, the great reshuffle, they're calling it, which I think is, is exactly the right term because uh, people are evaluating. And, and you look at the McKinsey study from last October about the three top reasons why employees are leaving. Well, they don't feel a sense of belonging or they don't feel valued by their manager or they don't feel valued by their organization. Boom. You got it, right? It's not about making more money in the next job and all these little things and, and, and a few uh, benefits. It's not about that, it's about that. And the, um, 
and I think this isn't isn't just true for the talent market. It increasingly uh, becomes important uh, with customers as well. I mean, I've talked uh, to a number of agency people, um, and many of them look at this and say, "Well, actually, culture trumps brand." So you look at the rep track global rep track um, uh, study, um, and Lego is the has been one of Walt Disney and Lego, I think, are the two that actually made the top ten each year. Um, and you see what's happening there and, 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 and people register it. And, and, and in the age of social media, transparency is everywhere. So you can't do things that you shouldn't do. And it's good that you can't do the things that you shouldn't do. I mean, remember the better.com when he fired 900, 900 people on a Zoom call? Jesus Christ. And I looked, I, I, I tried to, under, to understand about the company because I didn't know it beforehand. And uh, everything I, I read was, this guy had the right intentions and did a lot of good things over the years. And then he did this and everything was gone within, a, within, a, within five minutes, basically. So you gotta be clear about where you wanna go, who you are and where you wanna go. It is really important now on a unusual postscript to better.com after apologizing and taking a month to reflect, the board brought him back, which is cause for additional concern by some of their stakeholders. But again, this is these are the it is not as straightforward, and that's why, uh, as you mentioned, uh, with the soul system and in your book. It requires constant reflection and going through this, Ralph. It's not an easy uh, put a check mark in a box and move on process. It's a constant reflection process. It's a constant communication process and a constant behaviors of walking the talk, not just talking the talk. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, when you when you're having a global organization, I mean, we had like eighteen offices, and you've got cultural differences. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a different story whether you're running an office in, 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 in Brazil or in Moscow or in, 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 in Seoul or in Tokyo. It's a different story. And uh, you've got to understand those. And um, if you think you've got it right in, 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 in 16 offices, there will be two where you think there's an issue. So it's never perfect. It never is. But if you know where what to look for and what to look at, you can, you can manage it and you can, you can look at it and you can help people do it. And, and I mean, the, the emails I got were to me a great testament of uh, that, that, that actually that was delivered. And, and so it is possible, it is hard, but it's also a lot of fun. I mean, if you have fun, I mean, if you enjoy uh, working with people and through people, I mean, there's nothing better. I mean, to me, one of the greatest things that, as a leader, I was always happy when my people grew and, and moved into the, into the next position or into uh, into another uh, place. I mean, one of the guys who wrote one of these emails is a, is a French guy who an Australian uh, colleague convinced to move from Paris to Frankfurt. And by coincidence, I understood that his girlfriend was uh, Brazilian and we had to off, uh, open an office in, in Brazil. And I asked, so have you ever considered? Oh, but we're not sure. It's difficult with the job market. I said, well, why don't you spend four, four weeks down there and, and check it out and, and, and then we'll talk. And then he came back. Well, it was good. And clients were happy and said, okay, well, let's make it happen. And, and, uh, and he looked at this and he said to me, well, you looked at me. And I looked at you and, 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 and what you saw in me was the opportunity to actually leverage the talent for the better of the organization. And I, will, I benefited, the organization benefited, the client benefited, so everybody was happy. And, and these moments happen everywhere. And, and whether it's from Frankfurt to, to Brazil or whether it's inside Washington DC or whatever, it, it doesn't matter. It's it, the, the principles, are relevant for each business in each category, no matter how small or how big, how young or how old. 
They are. And that's why, as I mentioned, I appreciate, again, the questions you ask and the frameworks you provide and the questions you provide for leaders to ask themselves and ask their teams in the book. I would love to also know some of your thoughts and perspectives, Ralph, as many organizations are transitioning back to a somewhat hybrid future of work. Now, there are different definitions for what hybrid means to different organizations, but to a certain extent, many of the organizations that have the opportunity are giving their people the flexibility to work away from the office one or two days of the week, spending time in the office the rest of the time. And I truly believe that is going to be a much more challenging transition uh, than the transition was to a digital online work uh, for the past couple of years. So what are some of your thoughts with respect to that future of work? And what are some considerations leaders need to keep in mind in wanting to maintain that culture, that shared purpose, shared understanding, and shared behaviors when they have different sets of their team members in and out of the office at different times, dealing with each other in a hybrid environment? I think leaders need to really think about this and, and think about whether the flexibility of one or two days working from home is something that requires one day where everybody's there. Because Culture is about interaction. And um, I mean, we've all gone through two years of Zoom meetings and, and, and all of these. And I think while in the beginning, everybody was so happy that these things existed and that they were used. Um, what I'm hearing from many people is um, after a year, lots of Zoom meetings where uh, people shut off their cameras um, and, and, and then things like that. and and. What I'm also hearing and seeing is many people are happy to go back to the office or are very, very happy that finally they have got their clients and their colleagues in a meeting room again. Um, so there's that sentiment. I think if you go back into such a hybrid uh, structure, you need to define events that allow people to connect physically, not just uh, virtually. So. I mean, I talked about the Sparkapalooza a bit, um, whether it's these kind of things or smaller things, but you need to have coded uh, events that people uh, can recognize. When we started the company, we had point people in, in various countries. So we had these four offices, but we had another 15 people that were just, they were on their own in let's say Dubai or Tokyo. And these people, obviously we're working remote like nothing else. And uh, I mean, I came by or my other colleagues came by once a year for two days, wonderful, right? And then we invited them two or three times uh, into London or Frankfurt for two, two or three days, great. But if you put it all together out of 240 working uh, days, they were with colleagues for 10, 15 days. Um, uh, so basically not even 10%. So we needed to make sure that these 15 days were something special, something that got them so much motivation for the, the other 220 days that they were actually pumped up and, 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 and ready to go and got so much, such a high dose of, 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 of culture uh, within these 10, 15 uh, days that it was enough until people came back and uh, the offices uh, grew and so on and so forth. So be, be really uh, in a position to consider what is important and how can you codify um, the, these events uh, and, and these happenings because pe people will need it. And we talked about people need a sense of belonging and they want to be valued. And sense of belonging, um, yes, you can manage sense of belonging on a Zoom call, but not for long. So you better find ways to make sure that your people feel that they belong to your company, your team, uh, and, and, and move from there. And as, is, uh, and as is the case with the rest of the approach to Soul System, there has to be intentionality and thought 
put into it, Ralph, to be able to do that well. There is value, as you mentioned, to those human connections, and we can't just count on them to happen by default. We need to make sure we think about how we are going to encourage and make those human connections happen so people do build the relationships, build the bonding and connections. That is a big part of organizational culture. Now, Ralph, in addition to your book, I wonder if there are any leadership resources or practices you typically find yourself recommending to leaders as they want to become the kind of leaders that are growing, because you also mentioned in the book, it's important for uh, organizations to grow leaders in in their uh, organizations and also for leaders to grow themselves. So any recommendations you have with respect to resources or practices for that? Absolutely. So one uh, key element in the book in terms of, of growing leaders is the capability of emotional intelligence. And um, I think one, one thing people need to consider is um, Emotional intelligence is something you can learn. I mean, nobody is perfect, but you can learn these things. And there's a great um, tool that I encourage everyone to use. It's a company called EI Games, um, which is Emotional Intelligent Games. And this, the, uh, the company uh, is run by Kevin Allen and they offer uh, leadership, online leadership simulations. So you can basically, A, check your behaviors, <laughs> see what it does uh, or what you do <laughs> and what it leads to um, and uh, can play with it and find out which other behaviors because you always get choices in the various decisions that you have to take um, create which outcomes and uh, that's a highly recommendable uh, resource i can i can really only uh, recommend that and the other piece that i'm uh, uh, looking into uh, every now and again is uh, is a great book from from Peter Docker. It's called Leading from the Jump Seat, uh, and uh, is about basically handing over control because as a leader, that's what you need to, to be able to do because otherwise people can't grow. And uh, this delegation of responsibility was one of the principles in that constitution of the company with Bertelsmann where I started my, my professional career. And, and Peter's book, Leading from the Jump Seat, gives perfect uh, recommendations on how to do it. And he was a pilot, so he knows what he's talking about. And the, the, the start of the book uh, was really a crisis in the cockpit. Uh, and he was on the jump seat and his uh, student was uh, flying the plane. So fasten your seatbelts. Those are, those are a couple of great recommendations. I appreciate that, Ralph. First of all, on uh, leading from the jump seat, it is the fear associated with being in that jump seat and allowing the other person to make decisions that can be life and death decisions as you're sitting in the jump seat. And a lot of leaders are not even willing to let go of decisions that are not life and death. So that's a great recommendation. And with respect to emotional intelligence, it's amazing how many leaders have a fixed mindset with when it comes to emotional intelligence, believing that you either have it or you don't. Growth mindset says not yet, and you do have the ability to develop it. So I appreciate that uh, a tool that you mentioned that I'm going to actually check out myself also. So Ralph, how best can the audience find out more about you? I know you uh, do consulting. Um, around the uh, corporate soul and also your book, Building Corporate Soul. Yes, so the book's out and um, um, it's been a great moment when your first book comes out. So this is a very special um, time. Your, and, your first uh, baby. <laughs> there you go. And uh, um, well, you can find out more on buildingcorporatesoul.com. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can subscribe to the newsletter on Building Soul, Corporate Soul. Uh, dot com and uh, I'm always interested if anybody has any um, stories to share about drivers of soul inside the organization or companies that he or she thinks have got soul. Um, there's a form on the website. Please fill in. And there's also the soul check, where you can check uh, how your company's 
culture is actually doing in terms of um, soul or just culture. So have fun on buildingcorporatesoul.com. Well, I appreciate uh, both the book, Ralph, and the resources that you have on the website also, and most especially as the example of your own story and the many messages you got after you left as a CEO, uh, uh, you mentioned how people saw something deeper, something more valuable, and you from your own sensitivity, whether it was back in uh, uh, France, getting a sense of a different culture to then leading global organizations are someone that is in tune with your soul. That's why you recognize why it's important for organizations to have a soul and for leaders to bring their people along that journey. So I really appreciate your contributions to helping organizations and leaders have greater soul. Thank you so much for joining this conversation, Ralph Specht. Really appreciate having you. Mahan, it was my pleasure. It was a great conversation. Thank you very much. 